This is a handheld with a square screen and you might think this makes it a perfect Pico 8 device. Today we'll find out and I'll tell you right away. I kind of agree, but not just because of the screen. Let me explain. Hi, I'm Christian and this is the Pow Kitty RGB30. This thing has been making the rounds recently and I want to give you my opinion as somebody who is really into Pico 8. Now, as I already said, I do think that this is probably the best Pico 8 handheld out there right now. But in order to understand why, we need to look at this other device and talk about why this isn't so great for Pico 8. Chapter 1 Weiße Mio Mini is not so great for Pico minus 8. So this is the Mio Mini and I wanted to make a video about it for a while but didn't have a good opportunity until now. When this thing came out it made quite a splash and I think it caught many competitors off guard. In hindsight it totally makes sense. For one it is super small. It is literally the size of a pack of cigarettes which I can't show you because I don't smoke and I'm not gonna buy cigarettes just to compare. Anyways, despite of its small size, the screen is actually relatively big and bright. The resolution is 640 times 480, which was the good resolution at the time, and it is powerful enough to emulate anything up to and including PlayStation 1. Psst. The real killer on this thing is the software. It's called Onion OS. It's amazing. I'm gonna get back to it. Oh yeah, and the kicker was that it was selling around $50. Yeah, it's kinda a no-brainer why it was flying off the shelves. In fact, it sold so well, they ran out of screens to manufacture it and had to make like three hardware revisions. The price skyrocketed because of shortages, ironically, and competitors started to clone this thing to grab a piece of the pie. And Bernick released the RG35XX with similar specs, and now there is even a follow-up device, the more beefy Mio Mini Plus. And look, it even runs Pico 8. It's right there in the menu. You just select Pico 8 and boom, Celeste in your pocket. So yeah, lots of people have the Miu Mini, lots of people love the Miu Mini. And so naturally, lots of people recommend the Miu Mini as a Pico 8 handheld. And I'm gonna be real with you. I'm gonna have to ask you to cool it a little bit with the Pico 8 Miu Mini recommendations. It's not that great for Pico 8 and we are about to find out why. Don't get me wrong, I love this thing too. I think it's easily one of the best emulation handhelds out there, just not for Pico 8. Here's the thing, the Mio Mini does run Pico 8 games, it just doesn't run them natively. What does that mean? Well, running Pico 8 natively means you just grab one of the versions of Pico 8 from the website, for example, the Raspberry Pi version right here, and you put it on the device and that is what the device will run. That's what we call running it natively. Here's my previous recommended Pico 8 handheld, the Qi Game Force, and it runs Pico 8 like a champ. No notes. And the Mio Mini can't do that, at least not currently. All it can do instead is run an emulator core called Fake08 by John Bell. This is an open source Pico 8 emulator that runs in RetroArch. And listen, it tries very hard to be just like the real thing, okay? Give it a break, it's just a little emulator core and quite often it succeeds. Like here, we saw previously Celeste and here is Pico Racer. Here is a more modern game like Dragon's Fury. When it works, it works. But also it sometimes just doesn't work or doesn't work well. Here is what it sounds like when I play My Chance Sweet Buns. And here is what high stakes sounds like on the fake 08. In reality, it's supposed to sound like this. And yeah, Shape of Mind sounds bad too, and the halo is glitchy. Also, Sweet Buns and some other cards I tested won't save your progress. But it is perhaps the most disappointing when it just flat out doesn't work. Here I am starting the RoboZ's R-Type remake and it just, it just won't. 
And here is Dank Tomb crashing the device so hard I have to unplug the battery to reboot. So overall the experience with Faco 8 is hit and miss and you quite often can't tell if and how well something will work until you try it. I've seen some people on social media pass around a list of tested cards, so you can certainly live with it, but... Look, as you can tell, I'm kind of conflicted about this because I'm not here to dunk on a project like Faco 8. I think the job John is doing is commendable. All those people that got a Mio Mini or the RG 35XX can now play a ton of games from the Pico 8 library. That's just great. That's a huge 100% win for all of us. Fake 08. I'm glad it exists. Save yourself, John. John, you need to turn off the video. Turn off the video. It's coming. It's coming. Oh my gosh, it's coming. But. But the thing we want to determine here is what is the best Pico 8 experience. What if you are a Pico 8 fan or even a Pico 8 developer? What if you bought a device with a specific purpose to play Pico 8 games on it? In this case, we need to be honest here and agree that running Pico 8 natively is, and perhaps always will be, the preferable way to run Pico 8 games. Like sure, all those glitches and compatibility issues I talked about, I'm sure those will get fixed eventually. The gap between emulation and native app will get smaller over time. In fact, I'm running an old Onion OS here, so I'm sure actually some of those are already fixed. But the gap will probably always be there, at least because of one thing. Splore. So in case you don't know, the native Pico 8 app has this feature called Splore, which is kind of like a file browser, but also an app store. Except it's not quite like an app store because it's free. It hooks up over the internet into the LexLawful BBS and you can easily browse and download Pico 8 cards using it. It has a featured list for hot new releases. It even has a random card feature if you just want to browse the library. And in previous videos, I already talked about how essential Splore is to enjoy Pico 8 on a handheld like this. For example, I want you to just picture the procedure of getting a single card on a device that doesn't have Splore. Step 1. Power down the device. Step 2. Eject the SD card. Step 3. Put the SD card into the thing. Step 4. Put the thing into your computer. Step 5. Go to lexalofle.com. Step 6. Find the card you want. Step 7. Click on the card icon to get the card. Step 8. Put the card on the SD card. Step 9. Safely eject the SD card. Step 10. Put the SD card into the device. Step 11. Power on the device. Step 12. Launch the card. This doesn't work either. Kreitz große Fix Himmel Herrgott Sakramt Milek Stamash du Pfanner Scheiße Kackwurst and now imagine how you need to repeat this every single time you want to just try out a new Pico 8 card. Yeah, that's not going to happen very often. You'll find a handful of games that work and that is going to be your Pico 8 experience. You are not going to be checking in on new releases on a regular basis. You'll just leave it as it is and only go through that process if you see a game that really rocks your world. Man, Shadow King doesn't work either, huh? Not so much with Splore. You can just plop down on a couch and download any game directly from the device. All of the games ever made are already on it. It's kind of like a streaming service. No fuss, no questions about whether it runs or not. It's all at your fingertips. Now, for that experience, you need two things, both of which the Mio Mini doesn't have. You need to run Pico 8 natively and you need to have Wi-Fi. And for those reasons, I think the Mio Mini is not a great handheld for Pico 8. It's a great handheld that also plays some Pico 8. It's just not a great handheld for Pico 8. This difference between Pico 8 emulation and running Pico 8 natively is often misunderstood. Many people may not know the difference because either they aren't familiar with Pico 8 or with different types of handhelds. 
And this can be pretty frustrating if you are in a market for a Pico 8 centered handheld. If somebody tells you, yeah man, it runs Pico 8 like a dream, trust me bro, that may actually not mean that much. And it can be also hard to even find out how a given device handles Pico 8. Like, it says here that the Mio Mini is a Linux handheld, right? And Pico 8 has a Linux port, right? So you'd think that, but no. If you also find this confusing, I'll do a guide at the end of the video where I will provide you with some pointers on how to pick the right handheld. But for now, let us look at a handheld that genuinely plays Pico 8 very, very well. The Pau Kitty RGB 30. Chapter 2 Weiße RGB 30 is great for Pico minus 8. Okay, so we're finally getting to this thing. Quick disclaimer, um, this is not sponsored content. I bought this device with my own money and Pau Kitty doesn't even know that I'm doing this video here. Now to set the stage, the company Pau Kitty has been in a Chinese emulation handheld business for, for a while. They are, well, they aren't known for the best quality devices. They certainly make interesting devices. They also can do cheap. And this thing is certainly interesting and it is fairly affordable. Not quite as affordable as the Mio Mini, but a hundred bucks will get you there. And holding it in your hand, it certainly does feel cheap-ish. It is fairly light and the plastic is just okay. I actually do like plastic handhelds and I think this feels all right. It just doesn't feel like, you know, special. I do like the form factor though. This is something that surprised me. I have big hands and the tall screen makes the device fill out my palms. It's a strange but pleasant middle ground between a horizontal and a vertical handheld. It feels super comfortable to me. I can certainly play like this for hours. Now I've heard some people complain about the edges. Yes, it is a very blocky device with pronounced edges, but in my testing this didn't affect the handling negatively at all. Your mileage may vary, I guess. To me, this is a comfortable device. Let us discuss the burning issue of our current times. The buttons. They are fine actually. The face buttons and the d-pad all use rubber membranes with a tangible soft actuation point and a satisfying amount of travel. If you ever use an old school gamepad, this will feel familiar. You go like, you know, ah yes, this is what an average normal gamepad feels like. That being said, let me focus on two things about the D-pad that are worth noting. For one, the design of the D-pad is a tiny bit flatter and edgier than what I'm used to. So a Super Nintendo D-pad, for example, will have a smooth curved edge. This one is a bit sharper. It's almost exactly the same design as in the Unburnic RG351V. Like, this is not an accident, Pau Kitty. We see what you did there. Now it's not exactly the same D-pad compared to the RG351V. It feels a little bit less stiff and I do like that. The other thing to note is a subject that has the community up in arms recently and that is false diagonals. False diagonals can be a problem where the diagonal directions are a bit too sensitive and trigger when you want it to go straight. Here you can see me pressing down and if I wiggle to the sides with my finger, it will trigger the diagonals. And you might think that this is a surefire proof that this D-pad suffers from false diagonals, but it's not quite as simple. The thing is, every D-pad you've ever used probably had some amount of this. Here I am triggering a false diagonal on an original Super Nintendo pad. Here I am triggering a false diagonal on an iBuffalo Classic USB gamepad. Here it's on the Mio Mini, the RG351V, the Game Force. It is actually rare to find a D-pad that doesn't do this. You probably used D-pads like this your entire life and never noticed. It only becomes a problem if you find yourself triggering the diagonals by mistake. Hence, false diagonals. For example, this premium 8-bit dough SN30 Pro gamepad was ruining my Final Fantasy Adventure experience with severe false diagonals. Oh man, the D-pad is not great at this controller. It was so bad, I felt the need to open it up and apply some electrical tape. That fixed the problem, but now it's almost impossible to trigger the diagonals. No Hadoukens on this one anymore. What I'm saying, it's all a bit subjective. It all depends on the game. All D-pads have their quirks, none of them is worth any sin. And the question at the end of the day is if you can live with it, if you like how it behaves. With that in mind, all I can give you is my impression and my impression is that the D-pad on the RGB 30 is fine. Yes, it is a bit sensitive on the diagonals, but for me they won't trigger accidentally. I don't feel the need to have to mod it. This feels good enough to me. 
Now moving on, the start and select buttons use clicky micro switches, so do the shoulder buttons. And they are perfectly fine. I wished start and select were close to each other and below the d-pad like on the GBA, but that won't work here because we also have two analog sticks. And the analog sticks are literally the same as on a switch or the Anbernic devices for that matter. I don't know if they are from the same factory or knockoffs. Either way, if you ever use the switch, they will feel familiar. But also I don't care much about the sticks because for the games you run on this thing, they will probably barely get used. Whatever, they're fine. Now looking at the top, you have two buttons here for the volume level, a reset and a power button. Hmm, and what's that in between? Ooh, a micro HDMI port? Let's check that out later, shall we? I don't quite know how I feel about the buttons for volume control. I used to prefer a dial like you had on a Game Boy because that controlled the volume on a hardware level and didn't rely on potentially janky software. But then I got a Mio Mini with a dial that is also janky and now I don't know where I stand anymore. Well, at least the volume buttons on the RGB30 work perfectly fine so far. The bottom of the device is where it gets a bit weird. We have two USB-C ports. This one charges the device. This one is to attach things to the device, like you can plug in an external controller and and we're gonna see what works in a second. What I found a bit frustrating is that it's easy to get those two confused and the ambiguous labels don't help. Like if the one on the left is USB, then what is the right one? Chopped liver? There are also two SD cards and this may also be confusing. The left slot has an SD card with the operating system. The right one can have a second SD card just for the games. I've seen some of the manufacturers go for a split like this. I think the idea is that the system SD card is often formatted for Linux. Now if you are a Linux chad, you can put your games on the same SD card as your system. For all the Windows dirtbags out there, we get a second SD card slot that can be formatted to be readable on Windows. And that's where you can put all your games. But of course, if you are willing to put up with WinSCP, you can also easily live that one SD card life. Personally, I would recommend using two. What I would also recommend is to ditch the SD card that the device ships with. They are often slow and can die on you. Trust me, it's not a pleasant experience. Also, don't buy the version that comes with a second SD card pre-installed with ROMs. Just, just don't. Anyways, we also get the 3.5mm headphone jack. I like that a lot. There's nothing on the sides of the device and the back is strangely blank, like really weirdly blank. Don't they have to put some kind of, I don't know, certification labels on there? No? Nothing? Huh. That's how they roll in China, I guess. I always thought this would be a good place to put a hotkey cheat sheet on there. Like 8-bit dough does that on their controllers and it did save my bacon in the past. But despite some small nitpicks, overall, from the perspective of hardware, this is a shockingly inoffensive handheld. Pretty much everything on here is familiar and safe. For my big hands, I'd say the ergonomics are actually above average. That's pretty good so far. So let's turn it on, shall we? The software it comes with is called GelOS. It boots in an okay amount of time, just below 20 seconds to get to the menu, which is quick enough for it not to feel like a drag, but still a far cry from the Mio Mini's 8 seconds. I told you! Onion OS! So good! And the first thing that hits you when you boot it up is the RGB30's party trick. A nice high-res square screen. Mm. The resolution we have here is 720 times 720. The screen is 72 millimeters wide and tall, which gives you a PPI density of around 250 in the ballpark of a modern iPad. No touchscreen though. 
The 720 resolution sounds weird at first, but it works pretty well in practice and we'll see that in a second. JLOS runs the emulation station front and, and if you watch my Game Force review, it's basically the same thing. It's a nice polished UI made for emulation TV boxes, which works well here. The different systems are sorted by category. You can even download and install different skins if you like, this one is a default one. You can also use Wi-Fi to scrap data for your ROMs to get screenshots and video previews. And yes, you get a category category for Pico 8, so let's start with that. Okay, so I bet many of you want to know just how well does Pico 8 look on that screen. The square aspect ratio is obviously ideal, but on paper the resolution doesn't quite line up. Pico 8 is 128 pixels squared, 720 doesn't divide neatly into 128, so you'll get non-integer scaling if you want to use the whole screen, and in fact that is what Pico 8 launches like on this device. But due to the high pixel density this isn't that much of a problem here. Even with non-integer scaling, the resulting image is pretty sharp. And trust me, I'm saying this as an integer scaling hardliner. This is perfectly fine. But also, I am an integer scaling hardliner, and so by changing a setting you can make Pico 8 run in 5x integer scale, and I think, oh, it looks even better. The image is only slightly smaller with a small black border. Folks, this feels luxurious. A huge image you can get lost in, razor sharp pixels, vibrant colors. Look, here it is compared to the Qi Game Force, Anbernic 351V, Anbernic 351P, Clockwork Pi Game Shell, Pocket Chip, Mio Mini. Yeah, pretty big screen. In fact, I'm gonna say this is as good as it gets. We are at the upper limit of the comfort zone here, which is why I don't sweat the slightly smaller image going pixel perfect. With PQ8's resolution, I honestly don't need a bigger image than that. So we're off to a good start, let me show you the rest of the Pico 8 experience. Of course, this thing runs Pico 8 natively, the installation is fairly simple. Download the Raspberry Pi built from the Lexiloflow website, unzip it into the Pico 8 directory on the SD card and that's it. In the Pico 8 category in Emulation Station you just select Run Pico 8 and it will launch straight into Splore. As already mentioned, you can search and download cards directly from here. If you have your own cards, you can put them on the SD card and launch into them from Emulation Station or from Splore. Now shutting down Pico 8 is actually a bit confusing. With most emulators the shortcut to return back to Emulation Station is select and start. That doesn't quite work in Pico 8 for some reason. You need to press L1, select and start. And actually sometimes that didn't work for me, so sometimes you need to poke around in the explorer menu to find the shutdown command. This is kind of like one of those weird quirks of Pico 8, because if you launch from the main menu directly into a card, you get a shutdown option directly in the start menu. That doesn't happen if you launch cards through Splore, because uh, shutdown turns into return to Splore. The extra confusing part here is that Pico 8 has actually two menus. There is the pause menu and the escape menu. Some handhelds will map a button to escape so you can exit quickly, not the case here. Just one of those little annoying things. Maybe that will get fixed in the future by uh, someone? Well at least the volume buttons work and you can even control the screen brightness while Pico 8 is running. The battery life running Pico 8 is around five and a half hours with average settings. If you turn off Wi-Fi and run it at minimum screen brightness you can get even just over eight hours. That's pretty good. Of course running other more demanding systems will drain the battery faster. One thing to note is that the battery indicator is wildly inaccurate. Most of the time the percentage it shows seems to be lower than what you actually have. But then I also had a situation where the device shut down at around 40% on me. I don't know what's happening here. Luckily there is also a battery LED that turns red when the battery is really running dry and that one seems to be accurate. Now something I don't like about the RGB30 and other devices that run this type of firmware is the sleep behavior. 
You can put the device into a sleep mode by tapping the power button and in the gel OS menu you can even choose between S0 and S3 sleep. S3 being deep sleep. But in practice this doesn't work so well because both sleep modes will drain the battery over time. Here I left a fully charged device overnight on the deep S3 sleep and it woke up to 81%. Granted this is the busted indicator so who knows how much battery I lost here. So if you put it to sleep you need to also remember to turn it on back again soon or it will run the battery down. I don't know about you, but if I turn off a device, I don't want to be doing this kind of planning. On top of that, the device can sometimes even glitch out when bringing it back from sleep. This sleep mode is so useless, most of the time you want to actually shut down the whole thing. And that's cumbersome. You need to quit the app, pull up the main menu, quit, shut down system. Yes, I really want to quit every single time. And that's another one of those little things. Here, let me show you real quick how Onion OS does it. You just press the power button and it automatically makes a game state and shuts down the device, actually telling you that it shuts down the device completely. And the real magic trick is that when you just press the button to turn it on again, it will boot up. It will load the emulator that you used before. It will load the game that you played before and it will load the game state that you played before. So you can just continue playing right away where you left off. That's how it's supposed to work in 2023. I don't understand why other handhelds are still dropping the ball on this. So yeah, some details here and there a bit clunky. There is certainly room to improve, but also these aren't real deal breakers. The overall Pico 8 experience is super nice. As I said, just plop down on a couch and the entire Picoverse is right at your fingertips. But what if I want to play some other games? Well, I'll keep this part short because other reviewers like Russ from Retro Game Corps already did a way more thorough per system analysis. But one concern I heard being voiced over and over again was how the square screen wouldn't be optimal for game systems that aren't square. I've especially heard concerns about widescreen systems like the GBA. Ooh, but you're gonna lose so much screen real estate. That aspect ratio though. Ooh, I now initially I thought so too, but after trying out some systems I realized you need to think differently about that screen. You see, the screen is actually just as wide as on other comparable devices. It is pretty much exactly as wide as on an Envernic RG351V. It's just additionally taller. You just get more screen above and below. So for widescreen systems, the image is pretty much the same size as it would be on those other devices. For example, here is a GBA game running on the RGB30 with pixel perfect scaling next to an Envernic RG351P, which has a perfect aspect ratio for GBA. As you can see, the resulting image is pretty much the same. It's not so much the aspect ratio, it's also the size. And here is a real GBA just for fun. But of course, you get an additional boost in image size from systems that are more square. As you can imagine, the real winners here are the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Gear. Some of my favorite games are on the Game Boy and I genuinely enjoy the large, crisp image you get on this thing. The RGB30 really punches above its weight here and delivers an image comparable in size to a high-end device like the Analog Pocket. The NES and SNES are a bit weird because they internally run at an aspect ratio close to square, but that would often be stretched to 4x3 on the TV. So there are different philosophies actually how to best emulate them. For me the most appealing setting for the RGB30 is to run them at the internal square aspect ratio and pixel perfect scaling. Now the 720 resolution doesn't divide well for the resolutions of the SNES and NES, but if you shave off just a few pixels on the edges you can get a nice large image like this. In RetroArch this is called integer scale overscale and yeah, it looks incredible. It fills out the square screen so nicely, to me easily worth that tiny bit of crop in. Another thing the square screen does well is to show 
vertical games. On this channel, we have been discussing shmups for a while, and one thing that a lot of those arcade shmups have in common are the vertical Tate screen orientations. Playing those games on other handhelds used to be frustrating because of massive amounts of letterboxing, and the resulting image would be too small to play the game well. But on the square screen, those vertical games look just as well as their horizontal counterparts. Once again, the RGB30 punches way above its weight. Here you can see it run Aspirate, and note how the image is essentially the same size as on the way larger Nintendo Switch. This makes me think, did Pokédy accidentally find the perfect screen for emulation handhelds? With most of the handhelds, you would get that one system that doesn't look great, where you need to put up with a tiny image or a non-integer scaling. But so far, I'm struggling to find a system that doesn't look great on the RGB30. I did not expect that. Now granted, the RGB30 will emulate many arcade games, but that doesn't mean this is a high-end performance emulation machine. For shmups, it will do Dodonpachi, Ketsui, Esperate or Esp Galuda. It will hit its limits with Mushihime Sama Futari or like uh, Muchi Muchi Pork. Real shame. Also, if you are a stickler for low input lag, you might need to fine-tune the settings to get a reasonable performance. I'll admit freely I'm way out of my depth here and I'll leave that kind of analysis to the input lag nerds. It certainly looks like it needs work and you should come into this with low expectations. Okay, back to PQ8. On my reviews I often get asked if you can develop games on those devices. And because this is a handheld gaming device, my answer is usually no. However, I mean, this has that second USB-C port, right? So what happens if you plug in a small hub and a mouse and a keyboard? Oh my god, it totally works. You can easily code your games on this thing. And this time, the screen is actually large enough where it would actually make sense. I mean, this is bigger than the screen on a pocket chip or the dev term. Look, let's be real. This wasn't made to be a developed machine, and it's it's not. Like, for example, there's no easy way to access command line. But if you really need to, for some reason, you can totally make it work. But wait, what about that mini HDMI port? Well, that totally works too. It's not a Nintendo Switch, mind you. For me, I had to reboot the device and have a USB-C power cable plugged in because it saps a lot of power. But yeah, once it boots up with the HDMI cable attached, you can totally play all of the games on the big screen. You can plug in a wireless gamepad into the other USB-C port or use a Bluetooth controller and there you go. Big screen Pico 8 gaming, baby! Yeah, except I can't, for the life of me, make the wireless controller register as controller number zero, so Pico 8 keeps mapping it to player number two, and that's apparently a showstopper here. It's just another one of those things. To be fair, this is Pico 8 dropping the ball here, because it totally works with the emulators. But this is kind of emblematic of how these devices work in general. So if you are just about to drop some money on this, here's the last bucket of cold water that might change your mind. These devices are fiddly. It's all a hard hodgepodge of hardware and software all made by different people. Most of those people never talk to each other. Nobody's really responsible for it to work together. So there is tons of those little things that don't quite line up. You constantly need to fiddle around with those handhelds to make them do what you want. You will need to scour forums, github repos, discords for information. You will get very familiar with SD card formatting tools, partition management tools, WinSCP and the retro arch menu. And even if you do everything right, they still might not quite work as expected or glitch out or leave you stranded somehow. Just the other day, a friend of the channel, Ectane, got an RGB30 and in like 20 minutes when it became clear to him how much work this device needs to run well, he immediately abandoned all attempts and returned it. And I can't blame him, these devices are projects, they are a hobby in itself. No wonder we have channels like Retro Game Corps dedicated to guides and tutorials. These are not like a Nintendo Switch or a PS5 or even an analog pocket. And you can easily spend so much time setting them up that by the time you feel like you are ready to play, you lost all your motivation and you never do. That is why... I'm making such a big deal out of Onion OS on a Mio Mini. From all of the operating systems that I'm familiar with, this one feels the most like it's meant to be used with minimal faffing around. It feels the most like a unified experience designed to get you to play your games. And even here, even here, I had to like 
set up the scaling options in RetroArch, how I like them. And, you know, you assemble the entire ROM collection. <sighs> that is why I think a different way to rein in the faffiness is to set those devices up as dedicated Pico 8 machines. As you saw, the installation is fairly quick, Pico 8 runs on it without much drama, and you can quickly focus on just playing the games rather than tweaking display settings. So yes, despite some rough edges, the RGB30 gets my recommendation for the current go-to Pico 8 handheld device. It is easily currently the best way to play Pico 8 games on the go or from the comfort of your couch. And if you're up for it, it will emulate a whole bunch of other systems surprisingly well. Just be mindful of the rabbit hole. Features like HDMI out and the ability to potentially even hook up a mouse and keyboard are really just the cherries on top. This thing is pretty good. The things I don't like are mainly the sleep behavior, the battery management, and some inherent clunkiness of the operating system. Really was hoping some of those Onion OS features would set some new standards. I guess we need to wait a little bit longer. Now, while I think the RGB30 is currently the best Pico 8 handheld, it isn't the only one and the lead is not that big. Really, the most important features are being able to run Pico 8 natively and the Wi-Fi. From here, the screen is just like a bonus. It's a pretty nice bonus, but if you already have any other handheld that runs Pico 8 natively, I don't think it's actually worth spending all that money just for the nicer screen. Everything else is basically the same, and it's not like the screens on the Enbernic 351V or the GameForce G are bad, right? And hey, I might be wrong, or maybe in the future we're gonna get some other device that ends up being a compelling alternative to the RGB30. For this purpose, let me finish up with a short checklist of the kind of stuff that you're looking for when looking for a dedicated Pico 8 handheld. Chapter 3. What else is great for Pico-8? First of all, you want to run Pico 8 natively. Finding out if a device runs Pico 8 natively is hard. But let's start with some basics. It should run Linux. For example, these new GameForce devices look sweet, but as you can tell, they run Android by default. This is great for high-end emulation, but Pico 8 doesn't have an Android version yet, and the workarounds are... Uh... <laughs> Let's just not get into this, okay? As already said, anything other than running Pico 8 natively will be a compromise. But as we saw, even if a device runs on Linux doesn't mean it runs Pico 8. A good shortcut may be to check the chipsets. Two chipsets that are known to work well with Pico 8 are the old RK3326 and the new RK3566. There are quite a few handhelds with those chipsets and they typically all run Pico 8 natively. For example, here's the Anbernic RG353V and that one has the new one, the 3566, and it can boot into Linux. And yeah, I heard from plenty of people that this will run Pico 8 natively like a champ. The RG35XX from the same company runs on a different chipset and as far as I can tell, there is currently no firmware that will run Pico 8 natively on this device. Finally, you want to make sure the device has Wi-Fi. For example, the old Embernic RG351P has the right chipset, so it will run Pico 8 natively, but the lack of Wi-Fi will undermine the Splore experience. Yes, you can use a Wi-Fi dongle, or sometimes there is even a mod where you can solder in a Wi-Fi module, but it's always preferable to get a device that does it out of the box. Now, as you can tell, these are just general pointers. It's always important to ask around to make sure a given device is a good choice. A good place to ask is the Retro Game Handhelds Discord. Just be mindful that not everybody familiar with the handhelds understands the difference between emulating Pico 8 and running it natively. Hope that helps. I, for one, I'm really happy with the RGB30 and it will be my recommended go-to Pico 8 handheld moving on. Should that change, I will let you know. Until then, feel free to share in the comment section what kind of device you are playing Pico 8 on and how well that works out for you. Maybe that will help other people decide as well. Thank you so much for joining me on this hardware review. Be sure to check out my coffee to support my work. And yeah, see you next time around, guys. Bye bye.